You may have your seat, Susan. Uh, and as Caring Community Church, we, we, we are a house and a, and a church that is welcome and all-inclusive. We invite uh, all to come and hear from the Lord. Our visitors, you're most welcome to Caring Community Church. My name is John Paul. I am the chief shamba boy here in the vineyard of the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the vineyard of the Lord, right? And I'm grateful to be serving here as the pastor, senior pastor. And have the privilege of bringing God's word to us. And uh, thank you for the reminder about 7th of April. It's the Good Friday service. So you're most welcome. We'll have the service from 4.30 to 6.30. For those who will not have traveled, uh, we'll begin at 4.30 to 6.30. So please join us for that service in April. And then uh, we want to also appreciate those who have started to donate uh, food staff towards our medical camp. We remember the Mumbis who have donated quite some beans and we are very grateful. So please continue bringing those uh, donations so that we can continue to love the communities that will be ministering to uh, this coming August. Let us turn to the book of John. We have been going through the Gospel of John and we are in chapter 1. And today we are in verse 14 to 18. Such a rich, rich book for us as we continue. And so in your Bibles, you can scroll to, your, to the book of John. In your eye Bibles, those who have hard copy Bibles, if you're there, say amen. amen. Wonderful. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he whom I said, He comes after me, has surpassed me because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who was at the Father's side, has made him known. Join me in prayer. Lord, we are so grateful that your word is alive. And as we sit under the instruction of this word, it's our prayer that, Lord, you will speak to us, encourage us, challenge us, rebuke us, correct us, that we may be found faithful servants of God in every area of our lives. It's very easy for us to sit here, Lord, and to have things in our minds to distract us from this truth. And so, Lord, we choose to lay all that at your feet. And we are grateful that, Lord, you became flesh to dwell amongst us. Lord, as we go deeper into this word, and as you use me as your servant, I pray that, Lord, this word will come to your people in a way that, Lord, they will see you for who you are, and love you, and walk with you ever closer. So we thank you, Lord, for this privilege. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 So I was not supposed to preach this morning. Now that's not how you want to begin your sermon. <laughs> uh, but my good friend, Reverend Geshungu, as you have heard, lost uh, his mother. So he was supposed to be doing the sermon today. And so when we talked with him on Wednesday and we relayed this news, I quickly went to see him. And as we condoled with him, we had a light moment where he reminded me. Do you remember when you, your teeth had a problem and your leg and you could not preach and I stepped in for you? It's payback. <laughs> and my dentist here, she did a good job, by the way. Dr. Josephine, thank you. <laughs> it is not you. But we are very grateful to be sharing God's word. And uh, we continue to pray for Reverend Geshungwa, even as they plan to rest their mom. And so we have had some wonderful, wonderful messages from this book of John. Begin with Pastor Z, then Pastor Emma. And today I'm asking, what do you believe? What do you believe? Okay? Apart from God and the things of God, please turn to your neighbor and tell them what you believe in. You believe your team will win the Premier League? I'm not looking at you, Sylvia, but uh, hey, here we are. What, what, what else do you believe in? What else do you believe in? What else do you believe in? Uh, 
Has somebody said they believe in aliens? Uh, okay. I think people have shared what they believe in. Okay. It goes to show there are so many things we can really believe in. Okay. And one of the things growing up I believed in was that as a firstborn, how many firstborns are, do we have here? Oh, the Lord bless you. You are highly favored. You are highly favored. As a firstborn, I always believed I was getting the short end of the stick. And everything that could go wrong, whenever it went wrong, I was the first one. You are the firstborn. You should know. And I remember when I was in high school, I was so frustrated and angry because this was not right. I remember calling a meeting. I told my mom and dad we have a meeting tonight. <laughs> now, that is a miracle in itself. You know, telling your African mom and dad you're calling them for a meeting in their house as who? <laughs> but they obliged and they came. And I remember I sat there and my dad said, okay, please go ahead, tell us. And I said, I am tired of being a fastball. <laughs> I am tired of being a fastball. From today, please. I want to relinquish. <laughs> and guys, I'm laughing, but that day I was crying. I was saying, I can't take it. And my dad said, oh, we are sorry. What is going on? I said, you know, every time something goes wrong in this house, I have three siblings, and uh, I feel like I'm always there. I have to give an account, even if I'm not everywhere like God. I don't know what's happening. And of course, my dad was very uh, understanding. But my mom, praise the Lord for mothers. The only thing she could say, uh-huh, and a layer, and a layer. Uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. <laughs> and they quickly knew, change the subject. But you see, believing is much more than a matter of the intellect only. It is more than what you know. And last week, Pastor Emma shared a wonderful passage that I love in John chapter 1, verse 12 to 13. Because we are told that when Jesus came into the world, to the world that he made, the world did not recognize him. You know? Yet to all who believed in him and received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Let me use this chair. You can believe that this chair is constructed professionally, right? Study material. You can believe that uh, it will hold your weight. Even those who are watching their weight. It can, it can do all that, right? It is all in your mind. You can believe it. It's a construct of the mind. But what we are talking about here is you will remain tired unless you respond and say, now I will sit and find out if what I believe is true. And that's what we are talking about because there are so many people in church who believe the things about God, but they have not responded by faith and they still come in. They are weighed down by the cares of this world. They have not taken a step of faith and sat down on what they believe. Praise be to God. And that is why John wants us to appreciate. It is not just to believe. And actually James says in James chapter 2 and verse 19, you believe that there is one God good. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. I pray as you sit here, you will do more than just believe. You will respond by faith to that belief and begin this and continue to walk with the Lord. And that is why A.W. Tozer said, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What we believe is important and what we believe about God is more important. Why would you have two Christians live very different lives and they both believe in God? One loves God, wants to honor God. The other says, I love God, but they live in a manner that doesn't please him. It all comes down to what they believe about God. And we have said, and, and, and Pastor Z mentioned this, you know, the purpose that John was writing is that they may believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior and the Son of God and through him there is salvation. Not just believe it, but actually respond. Now, the Gospels have a uniqueness and a focus to it. Okay? This is just introduction, just to remind us where we are. 
And in a book known as The Gospels in Harmony, I like how each gospel has a specific focus highlighted, okay? And in Matthew, okay, because the Jews loved the scriptures and the prophecies of God, they would only listen to one of their own, so Matthew speaks to the Jews and the deeply religious of their day, okay? What about Mark? Mark spoke to Romans. These were leaders and leadership and action impressed them. They knew nothing of scriptures but everything of power. So to this group comes the action-packed gospel of the powerful ministry of Christ. What about Luke? Luke was a Greek speaking to the Greeks. The Greeks loved culture, beauty, ideas, happiness could be found in the pursuit of truth. And Luke fills his book with insights, interviews, songs, and details that fascinate the inquiring mind. And so today the truth seekers find Jesus in Luke. What about John? John was written to everyone. Praise be to God. Because everyone needs to meet God and only Jesus can reveal him. In this book, we meet an absolutely powerful God in human flesh who controls and rules the universe he created. It's all about Jesus for John. He wants you to be assured. There's nothing more. It's all about Jesus. And in chapter 1 alone, he uses seven names to identify Jesus Christ. It is significant because the Bible pays particular attention to names. Names speak to one's character, identity, personality, and purpose in life. He began by saying, in the beginning was the word. He calls him the logos of God, the word of God. And it communicated to the Jews of God's divine work and dynamic power. To the Greeks, it embodied philosophical reason, the word. Okay, and when you read again, he calls him the light. Seven times Jesus, uh, John calls Jesus the light. He entered into a dark world full of depravity to enlighten it with his divine light. We don't have to dwell in darkness. And so when we come to verse 14, which is the climax of chapter 1, because in a world that believed gods were removed from people and gods only visited them once in a while disguised as people, John is saying something profound. You know, what does he say in verse 14? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Okay? He introduces something theologically we call incarnation. Okay? Divine becoming human. Okay? Follow with me. Today you will have some big words. <laughs> incarnation. Divine becoming human. The word became flesh. Jesus took on humanity. Divinity took on humanity. God became a man. And we remember Jesus is the express image of God. Okay? Why is this important? That he should become human like us. But even before we get there, how can you tell if someone is genuinely a part or a part of a cult, a Christian or part of a cult? Start with what they believe about incarnation, what they believe about the coming of Jesus Christ. And you see, more often than not, we say we are all Christians in Kenya, but we believe very different things when it comes to the incarnation of Christ. Okay? And most Christian heresies center around the twin issues of the nature of Trinity and more specifically, the nature of Christ. Forget about the Jesus of Bungoma. <laughs> Next time you go and talk to your friends, what do you believe about the incarnation? John is telling us the word God, Jesus, who was in the beginning, became flesh. Now, there are several uh, heresies over the years about Jesus, and I need us to be very clear, okay? The first one is Pelagianism, and it simply says we don't need a savior. We can be saved by our efforts. And this was a heresy in the early years of the church, and they had to dispute that from a monk known as Pelagius, you know? We don't need a savior. We can be saved by our efforts. Have you found some people like that? That's what they believe, okay? Then we have the next heresy, Gnosticism. Which simply says Jesus is merely a human who attained enlightenment through gnosis, which is knowledge, and taught his disciples to do the same. It's, a, it's, it's, it's heresy, you know. 
they don't believe that the word, when they read this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. They don't interpret it that way. The most dangerous one was Arianism. Jesus Christ is a special creation of, by God for man's salvation. He is not God. He's just been created by God to save man. Woo! It's very close to the truth. But it is the farthest thing from the truth. Okay? And then we have what we call adoptionism. And these are the people who believe that Jesus was a human being who was adopted by God at his conception. So he was born man. Then after he was born, then he was adopted to be a son of God. Or at his baptism. And, and one of the churches that is very close to this is the Mormons, the church of the Latter-day Saints. And this is what they say, Jesus may be divine, but he is a derivative divinity. He derives his divinity from somewhere. And actually, as one Mormon theologian says, Jesus is God the second. That's what the Mormons believe. So are we all Christians believing the same thing? No. And then we have another heresy known as docetism that says Jesus was not really a human being, did not have a real human body. Jesus was an illusion. Man, I think they must have been high. Anyway, <laughs> you know, you, Jesus was not there. He was an illusion. So the disciples were talking to ghosts. They were walking with a ghost. They were walking with somebody like that. And then, of course, we have this heresy called as socialism. And this is the most, you know, tricky one because they say Jesus was an extraordinary man, a good man, but not God. And Jehovah Witnesses, this is what they believe. And that is why we say they are a cult. Because their belief is away from God's word. And when they come to you and you begin taking them to John, actually their Bible is written, when you read verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was, their Bible says, and the word was a God with a small g. They have changed it. They don't believe that he took on humanity being divine. And so every time that I have a meeting with these brothers and sisters, they keep on saying, no, 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 let's use our Bible. I say, okay, let's take all the Bibles and put them down and see and ask ourselves, why is yours the only one that is different? But that is what they believe. And that's why I said, incarnation is so key. But what do the scriptures affirm about Jesus? Apart from John, in Colossians 1, 15, the supremacy of Christ, we read, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he may have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. What about Philippians? You know, he emptied himself, right? He emptied himself from verse 5. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. He made himself nothing. He emptied himself, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even death on a cross. And therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name and that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father praise be to God so over and over in scriptures it affirms the divinity of God and the humanity of Jesus at the same time that's what we call the hypostatic union hallelujah leo mtakuwa theologian hypostatic the union that fully man fully God, at the same time. Now, I have told you about all the other people out there, what they believe. Ask your neighbor, what does KCC believe about Jesus Christ? What does KCC believe? 
Because if it does not agree with God's word, I give you permission not to come and worship here again. You need to find a place that affirms the word of God. What do we believe in? Okay? Of course, we believe in one God eternally existing in three persons, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, in the 66 books of the Old and the New Testament. And more importantly, we believe in the incarnation and virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, who by his shed blood and substitutionary death paid the redemptive price for all our sins and for the sins of the whole world. He rose bodily from the dead and ascended into heaven to intercede for us and he will come again in glory. We believe it. And that is why we say that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So John 1.14 is a key statement for us as we continue with this book. But why is incarnation important? Because the most basic explanation of this hypostatic union, the union that Jesus is being both fully God and fully man, is on this one area. The incarnation makes it possible for sins to be covered. Leviticus chapter 17 and 11 tells us that it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. Right? It is the blood that does what? That makes atonement. So if Jesus was not human, he was God, and we know God is a spirit, where could he have shed blood from? Right? Right? If God is an invisible spirit, and he is, how can he shed blood? And if he can't shed blood, how can atonement be made? The incarnation answers it. Jesus had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God. That he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Indeed, Jesus was born to die and to live again that you and I might find life in him. Praise be to God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace. Let's deal with the second part of that passage. Dwelt among us. Dwelt, as interpreted there, means pitched his tent. Temporarily nature is human. He pitched a stand among us. You, 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 you remember the Old Testament. The tabernacle was a tent that was pitched and he lived with his people. It is a familiar term. He wants to be close. He wants a lot of interaction. I like the message version that says the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. So if you come into a community and build a huge mansion with a wall around it, you're probably saying that you really don't want to be bothered by people. But a tent in our backyards, if you pitch a tent in this compound, you mean you want to interact with us. He came to pitch a tent in our human backyard so that we would have a lot of dealings with him. So not only did he become flesh, he chose to come and be with us and dwell with us. And then John says, we have seen his glory. They have beheld his glory. Could this be when John is speaking about the transfiguration that happened? Remember, John is writing this book after Jesus has ascended to heaven. He says, and we beheld his glory. But glory applies supremely to God, creator and rule of the universe, before whom all knees must bow. The reformer said, soli dio gloria, to God alone be the glory. We have seen his glory. Then, of course, he continues to say, he came and we beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. And grace is the undeserved gift. All that the giver wants is gratitude in return. Truth is that which has been tested and found to be right. And here's the good news for people like us. Because Jesus is graceful, we can come just as we are to him. We don't have to clean ourselves up. Pastor, I want to be fine, then I can come to Jesus. I want to be good, then I come to Jesus. Because he is truthful, you can come in complete confidence that he will keep his promise. The one present the world needs is grace and truth. We find it in Christ Jesus. A psychiatrist in 2008, in a news article, wrote, Christ reminds, Christmas reminds us of Christ. And he wrote something very profound in a South 
Carolina newspaper. He said, over and over again, I have asked suicidal or depressed patients what is pushing them to their brink. Their answer is so consistent that it must have a deeper meaning than we realize. I am no good, they tell me. Sometimes they are hearing voices, so I ask what the voices say, that I am worthless, that I should die. The problem is perennial. As long as humans have existed, we have sensed that we are not something that we ought to be. As long as we have been wounded by family, friends, or strangers, we have doubted our worth. The cure for all the fractured suffering of the human heart, all the terror we visit upon one another, all the guilt we bear with bent spines our whole lives, is the fact of grace. Grace, I propose, is the greatest concept in human history. Because it says, come just as you are. You are loved. You are worthy because he has made you worthy. Praise be to God. And that's why John says, he dwelt among us. We have seen his glory and he's full of grace and truth. Okay? Then John testifies concerning him in verse 15. He cries out saying, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. And we look at John the Baptist next week, but here he's simply saying, though I have started ministry before him, he was before me. He was before me, okay? Please, tell your neighbor, John the Baptist had come to make a way. <laughs> he came to make a way. He wasn't the way himself. It is important we realize, and that's why he says, I must decrease that he may increase. Okay? And then verse 16 and 17 introduces us to something very profound. From the fullness of his grace, we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Earlier on, one of the blessings we received was, we are children of God by right. You are the child of God. And now one of the blessings is that we have received this grace and truth from Jesus Christ. And we need to differentiate between law and grace. And that picture there says, the law says do and live. Grace says believe and live. We keep on coming back to that word believe. Believe and live. Okay? This is important for us because often we are caught up in legalism when it comes to a relationship with the law. But I want you to be freed to know that as you believe, you live. Okay? Does that mean we continue in sin as Paul poses? No. Grace frees us to want to serve God and live for him. So here, here is a table that I want us to look at. When we look at the system, what does the law say? It says you have to achieve it. Grace says you have to receive it. If I give you a gift, you only have to receive it. Law, you have to achieve it. You have to fulfill everything written down. And what is the purpose of the law? To show us our sin and our need to be right with God. And yet grace, the purpose, is to make us right with God. Praise be to God. Wonderful grace of God. So the law shows us our sin and that we need to be right with God. How many of you have read the commandments and, and the Old Testament? You thought, man, I have fallen so much short of all that the standard is required here. It's only God who can make me right. And what are the terms of the law? It is my responsibility. But grace is a gift from God. He has done it for us. And what is the emphasis? Law is what man has done. But grace is what God has done. Isn't this a wonderful place to say thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus. I don't have to do all these things. I cannot. But thank you for your gift. Blessing upon blessing. I like what one uh, gentleman wrote. Uh, uh, known as Braden Parks wrote. And he took that legal. In legalism and said. Looking at your own efforts to gain acceptance from the Lord. It will not happen. It will not work. You will be challenged. You cannot do it in your own effort. And, that, and I think that is why many people don't understand. You mean I just have to come to the Lord and accept him? No, there's something else I have to do. What else do I have to do? 
And remember, I was in the Roman Catholic Church for a long time. Part of what they believe is that there's salvation and there's works. There are things you need to do. Yes, there is salvation, but there are things you need to do. But the word of God tells us, Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith. Not by works that any man should boast. So grace and truth are things we'll hear much more about as we continue with the, with, with the gospel of John. It starts here at the incarnation. We are saved by grace alone. This is the great truth. But it starts with the incarnation. The penalty of sin is death. Jesus had to come and die. And so to be saved from this penalty and from the wrath of God, we need another to take that punishment. For salvation to be worked out, a major first step is that Christ is born into the world, incarnate. The word is made flesh. We then have Christ as our savior. He must come into the world in order to accomplish God's plan of salvation in the world. Then we come to the last verse there, verse 18. And John is writing and he's saying, no one has ever seen God, but God, again he gives Jesus another name, God. But God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Okay? An unbelieving world denies the divinity of Jesus. They deny that he is God. He is called a great rabbi, a great teacher, an inspiring teacher, a moral reformer, a social justice advocate. But that will not do. He is God. Praise be to God. And so here's the conclusion of the matter. What is the implication of incarnations? It is far-reaching. Here just for a reason. Number one, he came to reveal the Father. Jesus came to reveal the character and the nature of God. Everything you see, Jesus, that is the character of God. Compassionate, yes. Loving, yes. Unconditional love, that is who the Father is. And so when Philip says, show us the Father, he says, come on, Philip. How long have you been with me? If you have seen me, you have seen The second thing he came to do is to redeem mankind. Jesus was born under the law to redeem those under the law. Galatians 4, 5 says, But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. He also came to reign over the creation. You see, Jesus' reign will not end. It did not end at the cross. It began before creation. In the beginning was the word. And was partially realized when he was crowned at Calvary, bearing a crown of thorns. His first coming was to bring salvation from the penalty and power of sin. His second coming will bring salvation from the presence of sin. Hallelujah. Did you hear that? His first coming is salvation from the penalty and the power of sin. His second coming, salvation from the presence of sin. That is why today, though we are saved, we are still groaning. We are in pain. We have loss. We have pain. But a second coming, there will be no more pain. No more death. No more illnesses. No more sicknesses. The presence of sin will be eradicated. His rule and reign will culminate when he returns. But I like the fourth one. He came to relate to us. How many of you have been watching this program known as The Chosen? Have you heard of a program known as The Chosen? Now, let me tell you. You need to go and watch that show. It's a series. It's about the ministry of Jesus. And it's on Netflix, amazingly. When I went over abroad, that was among one of the top watched shows out there. But it's the story of Jesus. They are trying to, they have the artistic freedom of trying to say the things that are not written there, how was Jesus relating with people? But every word of the scripture that is in scripture. Jesus says it correctly. But I love that show because it shows Jesus who relates with people. Sometimes you can read the gospel and the Bible and you think Jesus is a principal walking around with a cane. And he is telling Nicodemus, unless you're born again. <laughs> but he came to relate with us. That's why we have been watching that show with my family and it's an amazing place for you. So, hey, go and check it out. The chosen. But Jesus is fully acquainted with the full spectrum of humanity. What an amazing reality. Jesus became one of us. And sometimes it is hard for us to walk in someone else's shoes. Because we, we, we don't really know what that means. 
Personally, I don't know what it is like to bury a spouse. I don't know what it feels like to be served divorce papers. I am not quite sure how unemployment feels. Or maybe you have missed meals with your children. Or I have not had to listen to the doctor give me a concerning prognosis. But it can be incredibly reassuring when you are struggling and someone comes up and says, I have walked in your shoes and I can relate to your exact situation. Praise be to God. I can understand. I can empathize. You will make it through because I did. And for us, when we lost our daughter, that is exactly what happened. People came alongside and they said, hey, pastor, I went through this. I lost a child. This happened. And we felt so loved and encouraged. So Jesus came. He is acquainted with our sorrows, with our sufferings. He knows the lure of temptations and the fear of standing alone in righteousness. He can relate to being mocked, spit on, rejected by friends. So when your friends reject you, he can relate. Jesus understands when it what it means to lose someone you dearly love and to weep for them. He can sympathize with those who are misrepresented or judged or forgotten, mistaken, abandoned or beaten, shamed or lied, divorced because the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Now one of the things the church has not done well is to come alongside those people who are really going through tough times. Because we have made churches to be a place for perfect people. So I come with my challenges, but I keep it in because I have to be perfect. And I want to say this for those who are in this congregation. You're going through a messy divorce. You're a single parent. Separated. We extend a hand of fellowship to you. Your identity is more than what you're experiencing. It is in the incarnate God. We may not understand what you're going through, but you're still welcome for fellowship. We extend that heart to you. See, KCC is not a church for the perfect. And if it is, I will make it imperfect. Because I am not perfect. It is a house where we acknowledge our need for the Savior wherever we are. And we say, come, brother, come. You are loved by a Savior who loves you. And I love this quote as we end by Dietrich Bonhoeffer a theologian who said, only the humble believe him and rejoice that God is so free and so marvelous that he does wonders where people despair. That he takes what is little and lowly and makes it marvelous. And that is the wonder of all wonders that God loves the lowly. God is not ashamed of the lowliness of human beings. God marches right in. He chooses people as his instruments and performs his wonders where one would least expect them. God is near to lowliness. He loves the lost, the neglected, the unseemly, the excluded, the weak, and the broken. That they may believe, hallelujah, not only is he kind and gentle and humble, our Savior is faithful and loving. He wanted to come and pitch his tent where we can relate with him and know him. Let me end with this illustration. She was 15, he was 17 when they met. All through high school, they dated, and after high school and college, it was no surprise to anyone when they married. Four years later, she was standing in her kitchen with a pile of dirty dishes in the sink. Two children at her feet, crying and making a mess, a pile of dirty diapers in the corner. Tears were streaming down her face. Can some of you relate? <laughs> Looking back, she could not quite be sure why she made the decision. But here she is. She took off her apron and walked out. She called that night and her young husband answered the phone. He was understandably quite worried and also quite angry. Where are you? He said his concern and his anger fighting for control of his voice. How are the children? She asked, ignoring the question. Well, if you mean, have they been fed? They are. I have also put them to bed. They are wondering just as I am, where you are, what are you doing? She hung up the phone. But it wasn't the last of the phone calls. She called almost every week for the next three months. And her husband, knowing that something was seriously long begun in those phone calls, to plead with her to come home. He would tell her that the children were with the grandparents and they were well cared for. He would tell her that he loved her. He would tell her how much they all missed her. And then he would try to find out where she was. 
when the conversation turned to her whereabouts, she would hang up. Finally, the young husband could stand it no longer. He took their savings, hired a private detective to find his wife. The detective reported that the runaway wife was in a nearby country, living in a small bed sitter upstairs. So the young man borrowed some money from his in-laws, bought a plane ticket, and flew to this country. And as he climbed those stairs to his wife's room on the third floor, he was sweating. He had rehearsed a speech, but now he had forgotten all of it. What could he say? There was doubt in his eyes. His hand trembled as he knocked on the door. When his wife opened the door, all he could say, we love you so much, won't you come home? She fell apart in his arms and they went home together. One evening, some weeks later, the children were in bed and he and his wife were just sitting around and talking. He finally got enough courage to ask the question that haunted him for many months. He asked, why won't you come home? Why, when I told you over and over again that I loved you and missed you, didn't you come home? And she, with profound simplicity, said, because before, those were only words. But then you came. But then you came. Jesus came. He personally comes to each of us offering grace and truth. He's not a God far removed from his people. He has come. He didn't stand off at a distance. He is personally reaching out to you. Will you come to him? Will you let your life reflect this truth? Will you let your faith be evident as you live this truth? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we are just so grateful. We have no words to say thank you that you came. You stripped off of everything to take on humanity and the nature of a servant and to die obediently on the cross, to make a way for us to know you and to live for you. God, I'm praying that this word will bear fruit in our lives. We will relate with you more intentionally because you came. You will not be a God that we talk about. It's a God that we relate with. It's a God that we know. And I know there are many in this sanctuary who maybe have felt as if you're far off, but you came. You relate with us. You know us. Thank you for the blessing upon blessing that you bestow on us. I especially pray for those, Lord, who for many years have believed things about you, but they have not taken a step of faith to respond to what they believe. That, God, they will do so with joy in their hearts. That you, O oh God, because you came for me, I can give you me. So I pray for them, O oh Lord. Thank you for the gospel and the good news that you have given us. We worship you. We praise you. May we meditate on this truth and just thank you for who you are. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Let me request us to rise up as we sing this song. And afterwards, I'll come up for the benediction. And if you need prayer, the pastors are here. You'll not be in a hurry. So let's sing together. There is one gospel on which I stand for all eternity. It is my story, my father's plan. The sun There is one God.
with a fruitful week and an opportunity to just share what a wonderful God he is. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Our visitors, you're most welcome for a cup of tea at the tent downstairs. It's good to see you.